Hello everyone, this is Al Fadi and I am so excited today for this special episode that is related to a most recent series that I did with Dr. J. Smith about corrections that were done to early Quranic manuscripts. The series was actually based on this particular book that was newly released at that time, and the book here in my hand, which reads uh, the title, Corrections in Early Quran Manuscripts, and the author of this book is Dr. Daniel Allen Brubaker. Now, we gave a brief background at that time concerning the author and the nature of the book itself, and then we did nine videos to unpack the material that is found in there. Well, today, I'm excited to tell you that Dr. Brubaker himself is joining us online via Zoom, and we are so excited to have him with us, and hopefully, uh, in the time that we have, he will also add more to the material that was shared with you. And joining us as well here in the studio in person is Dr. Jay Smith as well. Dr. Brubaker, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us, and uh, we're so excited to have you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation, guys. Absolutely. Well, Jay? Dr. Brubaker, we've, um, we have not only have we highlighted this book uh, in our series back in 2018, and I would encourage anybody to go on Sira International, to go on Fander Films, to just look at the episodes that Al-Fadi and I, where we unpacked it, gave examples of it, and really tried to underline the impact of what this was saying. We went further than Dr. Brubaker would have gone, as we love to do anyhow, and we actually came to conclusions on it. But uh, back in May 26 of this year, 2019, so a number of months ago, I went to London, and on my way through London, I stopped off at Hyde Park where I met Hatun Tosh. And Hatun Tosh and I got up on the ladder, and I think I'm corrected, uh, Dan, we actually introduced this book from the ladder two hours before it was published. That was how down to the wire we had to get it out so that everybody would, would uh, go and buy it. And at that time, we had uh, Mansur Ahmad, who is one of the authorities for the Islamic Awareness website, who was in the crowd, was told about it. There were others who were in the crowd. There were quite a few Muslims waiting. They didn't know we were going to do this. And he had to get on the ladder to confront us. And he struggled, and we'll get into that a little later. He struggled with it because he had never really come across this. Uh, and I remember asking him, why is it you hadn't come across this? Why is it none of you Muslims have actually looked at these corrections or variants? Why is there nothing published? And why is it it's taken an American who did his doctoral thesis on this, why did it take him uh, to do something that's been around for 1,400 years, as you claim, and you haven't done it. So what I want to do is I want to ask you, Dan, if you could kind of give us a brief background into why you even went into this area. What was it that really motivated you? What was it that you saw that, that uh, picked your uh, interest or your appetite? And where is it that this all, this all came from, but what is it you are now finding? If you could kind of give us the backstory behind this book, and as I understand, this is not the last book. They'll be doing many more, am I correct, uh, uh, on these variants? Yeah, this is just a very, uh small and basic introduction to the stuff that I've done and uh, hopefully it's the first of first of many the uh, big book actually a big series of books is uh, is in progress of being prepared for publication uh, at a more academic level and there are a series of different projects that I have that I have going on this um, in this area and, and related areas so yeah it's just a start and uh, you mentioned a number of different things which you know, I follow sometimes and, you know, I don't, I don't follow entirely, but I do know that there's discussion out there around these things. As to what got me interested, it's probably the, the combination of um, factors as I was doing my doctoral work in the general area of Islam, early history of Islam, um, of course, I became aware of the sense uh, about the Quran's transmission, uh, much of the history of the Quran transmission that um, is traditionally accepted is rooted in the oral, um, in the oral nature of the transmission, um, the sense that it was perfectly orally transmitted. Uh, of course, we know there, there, there were manuscripts, um, but the sense was that those were also, um, that those would also reflect the perfect nature of the transmission uh, orally, if, if indeed they uh, that that was a true account, and so 
what got me really interested and just backing it up a little bit further is I've, I had been interested for a long time in biblical textual criticism, uh, archaeology, uh, biblical manuscripts, and so forth. And so I had this awareness of that whole uh, rich, now several, a couple hundred years, rich history of biblical textual criticism. And at one point in my doctoral work, I was shown by Dr. Keith Small um, a couple of pictures of corrections, significant corrections in early Quran manuscripts. And, and um, I was just pretty, um, what would I say, surprised by having seen those. And I thought, you know, I, I didn't know the extent of the phenomenon, if there were a lot of corrections like this in manuscripts, but I found it very interesting. And I thought uh, this is worth asking some more questions of. So in very brief, there's a lot more to it than that, but in brief, that was what got my, captured my interest. And I started looking into it and started looking at manuscript, manuscripts first in photographs that I was able to uh, get hold of. And that in itself was not an easy thing to do. But then I started uh, as my project, doctoral project progressed, I started making trips. I made two overseas research trips before defending my doctoral dissertation, one major trip in, I believe it was 2011. And I started going and visiting these manuscripts in person and um, take documenting what I saw in, in corrections inside them, um, taking photographs when I was permitted to do so. And I really went all over the world uh, seeking these. And by now I've actually been, uh, well, maybe that's material for a, a subsequent question, but. Can I, can I stop I you right there, Dan? Yeah. Dan, back up just a bit. You took trips around the world. So you went to museums, you went to libraries. Had this been done before you did this? Were you, did you know of anybody else that has done this kind of work prior to you doing it? And if I may add also, it's really crucial for uh, people, especially our Muslim friends, to know that your work was based on tangible things, not just you're looking at somebody else's images. Right, yeah. I'll, I, I would say that most of my work has been looking at the manuscripts themselves, holding them in my hands, uh, going through them line by line, and making notes, taking photographs, and uh, not working from other people's photographs. Uh, indeed, many of the, the pictures, I, I just offhand, I would say that half the, at least half the pictures in the book, but I, I've just counted them and just guessing are, are photographs that I took myself uh, in front of the manuscripts. And, uh, but that to say, there's nothing necessarily wrong with looking at photographs of others. The photographs of manuscripts that exist at, from some of the libraries, National Library of France, um, British Library, uh, Cambridge, and elsewhere are in some cases very high quality. Uh, but there, I will say that there is still uh, a great benefit in having the actual manuscript in front of you. Even a very high quality photograph, it can be hard to tell what's really going on on the manuscript page when you're trying to judge whether a correction has taken place or if perhaps something is shining through from the other side of the page, maybe some ink, a shadow of ink or something like that. So uh, what I've done is, for example, if I have any question about something, I, when you have the manuscript in front of you, you can uh, lift up the page and shine a light from the other side and you know look very closely with a magnifying glass and see if there's uh, erasure uh, scratches on the page or things like that. And that's why it's really, really good to be able to see them in person. We're, back to my question again. Were there others that had done what you'd done before? Well, there have been others who have studied the manuscripts. I'm not aware of anyone else who has made a project of looking um, specifically and extensively at the corrections in the manuscripts as I've done. Because isn't this one of the major claims of Islam right there, of Muslims all over the world, that there have been no changes? There is The Quran we have today is the same that has always existed. Uh, the one that has always existed for 1,400 years is the same uh, that would be uh, on those eternal tap. Isn't this the claim? At least it is on the ground. I don't know if this is an ad academic claim. Are you? Have you heard this claim before? Yeah, I have heard the claim. Uh, and uh, I'm glad you brought it up because I sort of have straddled two worlds in in this book 
by trying to communicate to a, a general audience and I was criticized a little bit for it in a recent uh, review of my book that came out uh, because in the academic world, of course, it's not extremely controversial that uh, corrections would exist in the manuscripts, partly because um, partly because there are mistakes that scribes make, and that does account for a portion of the corrections, in my view, and I think that's a reasonable thing to come to. But the, the other thing that uh, was mentioned in this review is that the early literatures uh, do have uh, references to some of the messiness in the early manuscript tradition. And so that's just not known, uh, and it's not popularly talked about today. So when I deal with this popular opinion, it isn't as though that, that that has always been the opinion about the Quran. And so that's an important aspect of this whole discussion and that uh, needs to be remembered is that there's a, um, when you're looking at this, you need to go all the way back through the history and look through the early sources, secondary sources, and so forth to really put together what's going on. Yeah. Okay, but I, I want to add something, uh, Jay. Uh, you know, as a former Muslim myself who grew up in Saudi, who speak Arabic and read the Quran and studied its original, uh, basically, or primary sources, I can assure you that the idea that there were changes or corrections or differences was never ever brought up or even okay. insinuated to us. So uh, from that aspect, I can speak for the vast majority of Muslims myself. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me ask you, well, let's follow yeah. up on that. Why is that important for a Muslim? Why must the Quran not have been changed? What is, help me here, because we have no problem. We assume this with the Bible. We know that the Bible has been changed. We even warn the readers of where the changes are. Why is this such a difficulty for Muslims to accept? Well, I mean, the changes in the Bible is not uh, the idea that a Muslim have, which is corruption. That's what they think when you talk about a change or at least copyist errors and things like that. But we are very transparent about it. We have footnotes, we have documents and things like that. When it came to Islam, it's taboo to even think for a second that there has been anything that was tampered with. And I speak again as a former Muslim, someone who grew up with this mindset. To me, it would have been disturbing to think that I am believing in a book that is supposedly preserved in heaven, not just on earth. And somehow, <clears throat> at the same time, I am believing that it has even a single letter that has changed or moved from its place. So that's where it becomes crucial. So it confronts the whole notion of what the Quran is to a Muslim. Is it's the saying. preservation and the uh, basically uh, the uh, revelation of the Quran okay. itself. Now, you, you mentioned two things, Dan. I wanted to pick you, pick you up on this from what he's saying right here. You mentioned the popular world and the academic world. The academic world, you're saying, is this is not a problem. On the popular level, this is a huge problem. Can you, can you, okay, can you help us with that? I don't know that it's not a problem in the academic world. Um, it seems from some of the things, and again, I don't follow the discussion around my book as much as people might think that I do, but um, it, from what I've seen, the attempt it has been to suggest that every one of these changes is correcting a, um, is correcting a, scribal, a mere scribal error, human error in the manuscripts. And while I think that, as I mentioned already, while I think that is the case uh, for some of them, I don't think it's the case for all of them, and I think it clearly can't be the case for all of them. As to why that would be a problem, of course, it, you know, delving into the belief system, which is not someplace that I go with, with, my, uh, with my research, I understand that's something that you guys do. But of course, it, it would be jarring if you did um, believe something about the transmission of the text akin to what we just mentioned is the modern notion, and I think probably has been um, around for a while, um, because it doesn't really align with that, and, and it, it, it would be quite disturbing, uh, I suppose, in that situation. Yep, and I'm really glad uh, you mentioned that, uh, Dr. Brubaker, and it's really, I speak to my audience right now, and I tell them, Dr. Brubaker's book intended for uh, basically as a, a, a pure, transparent, academic uh, findings, uh, in his book, uh, nowhere does he mention um, my book refute this faith claim or that faith claim. Uh, his intent is not really to be used as an apologetic tool, not at all. I mean, he's just 
laying out findings, and at the same time, it's based on his own uh, dissertation and research, and more of this will be coming out. And it, it's people, you know, basically like myself who have passion for uh, defending the faith and at the same time uh, doing critical assessment that we look at these things with a different uh, binocular, of course. So I want to make sure that Dr. Brubaker know where he endorsed anything, for instance, concerning the show that we did or even suggesting that the book should be used for things like that. That's extremely important for us to clarify out there. Can I go one step further? A number of these, in fact, almost all of them, uh, I think I'm correct in this, you do say that once these insertions or these erasers or these coverings, once these have been corrected, once the corrected correction is there, they now support the Huff's manuscript. Remember you said this right through your book quite a few times. Yeah. What do you mean by that and why is that important? And can you help us understand why that's significant in, in this whole discussion? They support the Huff's manuscript. Help us here. Give us, explain what you mean by that. Okay. So I wanted to go back to uh, what uh, Al said a moment ago, and that was um, that, of course, I'm not setting out to do the sorts of things that, that you guys do, but I've also defended against criticisms from uh, some fellow scholars uh, about what you guys have done by saying that I think it's entirely appropriate and fair for anybody to take uh, an academic's work and to talk about it and to talk about the implications of it and what are the effects uh, on the ideas that underlie it. Obviously, the Quran is a, is a book that uh, that uh, affects the way more than a billion people in the world live their lives. And I mentioned this in my book a little bit. And so it is important to um, uh, to to ask questions of it and to and to test it and so forth, and I, I think that's entirely appropriate. So that's all we're saying about that. I, I, I don't uh, I don't um, fault anybody for doing um, the sort of thing that you guys are doing. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Okay. So I'm um, getting to the second question. Did you want to say anything more, Jay, about um, that before I answer the question that you asked? No, and I appreciate you doing that, and I think this is a difficulty. It seems to me that you have, there seems to be a double standard here, and this is fascinating that, uh, that, that these academics are saying, don't you dare come to conclusions, and who are they to, to try to look and try to understand why is, it, uh, why is it that Muslims are saying one thing, that the Quran has never been changed, and yet when two other scholars come up and say, well, yes, there have been changed, and this therefore confronts this notion that has never been changed. If you were to say the same thing about the Bible, Bible, and I would suggest there have been lots of criticisms of the Bible. I don't hear anybody saying that we should not ask these questions of the Bible. And this has been asked for almost since the 1800s about the Bible. And I, I don't know anybody that would suggest that you should not take that to its logical conclusion and look at the ramifications of historical criticism and, and, and a very good redactic source criticism on the Bible. So there seems to be a double standard here. They get upset if we take this these conclusions to its law conclusion looking at the Quran, but they don't get upset when we do the same thing on the Bible. Yeah. Um, well, I think that when textual criticism, criticism began on the Bible, there were some points of discomfort with that. But um, as you correctly note, today uh, people are not uncomfortable with textual criticism being done on the Bible. Um, my view, and you guys know I'm a Christian, is that uh, if something is true, it will stand up under under scrutiny. That's right. And, you know, so I, I'm perfectly comfortable with uh, with pursuing evidence wherever it leads, and I, I think that's a very healthy way to go about life. So, Arif, let's uh, go back to the second question, and that is, why is it that these corrections seem to uh, create or seem to standardize the text to this reference huffs that you keep bringing up with. Can you explain that to us? Well, the interesting thing to me is, well, I, I, I didn't go at this looking for any particular answer to that question, but what I have noticed is that most of the corrections wind up with a rossum that is the skeletal text that is in conformity at the point of the correction with the, with the Haas text. And by being in conformity with the Haas text, I don't mean that it has the dots and the short vowels 
as the Haas text has today, but that the um, skeletal text at the point of the correction aligns with the Haas text. Now, in most cases, I can't see what was written underneath that correction. And so is it possible that what was first written there was also in alignment? Yeah, it is, but then that would be the the question would be why then was something uh, erased and overwritten or otherwise corrected, and so the interesting thing to me is that, well, what what does that what does that tell me, aside from the from the instances where there was just human error and it was corrected, and dealing with the other situations where I don't think it was human error, it seems to indicate a picture in which there was a certain degree of flexibility. I don't think it was great, but there was a certain degree of flexibility perceived in the mind of the scribe, whether they were copying from an earlier example or they were copying from their oral memory uh, or whatever the case may be. There was a perception at the time of production of some of these manuscripts that what was first written was in fact the correct text. And so, what it looks like is that at some point in time, uh, after the production of these manuscripts, they were um, made to conform more closely with, not entirely conform, because there still remain places in these manuscripts that are not uh, quite in conformity with the with the Hoff's text, but to made made to conform more closely with um, with the Hoff's text. So that looks like a a, a, a pyramid that's that's moving toward closer toward conformity over time. That's a very oversimplified picture, but, uh, but that's, a ge that's a general answer to what the picture looks like to me at this point. And there will be people who criticize me or challenge me on that, and, they, and it's based upon uh, a different interpretation of the evidence, and I'm happy to consider all those things as well, because I'm not stuck on a particular interpretation. I'm just trying to uh, convey what it looks like to me at this moment. Daniel, I would suggest if you see a racer in a text, if you see a racer of a few words sometimes, if you see of an insertion of an entire line, if you see in one case, we have one example that you've put up there where there are eight different coverings on one page, and what has remains now conforms with the Huff's text, I would suggest that there, there is a concerted, uh, a concerted effort to standardize the text. But here's, here's the problem, and, and let me, uh, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to. We know that the Huff's text was only chosen for the city of Cairo in 1924, for the, for the country of Egypt in 1936, and was only made worldwide as a standard for the whole world in 1985. Uh, that's re only 34 years ago. What does that say, just off the top of your head, if indeed they're standardizing it to this text? This text is not even 100 years old. How could they then even standardize it in, in manuscripts that are disparate in many different countries, uh, which would not have come under this rubric, would not even have been seen as the official text uh, until 34 years ago? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because I think it's important not to not to make too much of the modern. Um, well, Hafs on Awesome is a reading tradition that goes much farther back than than this past century. Uh, the what you're talking about is the Cairo edition, which is now in the 19 the 1985 edition has some other very slight um, improvements made to it as well. And there's there's a whole history of the of the printed. Um, of the print history of, of the modern Quran, but I, I, I would say it's uh, too much to say that the fact that these conform to that version indicates a much more modern uh, process toward conformity. That's not what I'm saying, but rather uh, I had to choose something as a standard or as a point of comparison that was just going to be a uniform, universal point of comparison in my work. And so I chose the modern standard, which is Hafsan Awesome, the, the Cairo printing, the Cairo edition. And that, it, it doesn't mean that I think that these corrections are pointing toward some future thousand years of future edition, but just that uh, they tend to go toward that um, uh, skeletal text. The other thing that I'll say about that is we don't have a big enough data set. So we don't have, um, as you know, we have thousands of uh, instances of correction, but as far as propor portion of the entire Quranic text that has been corrected, it's not, um, it's, 
it's not anywhere near the entire text of the Quran that has uh, corrections in it. These corrections are sort of concentrated in different areas and, and so forth. Yeah. Okay. And it's really interesting, uh, Dr. Brubaker. Uh, I mean, any way you look at it, and, and I uh, definitely I'm not putting words in your mouth, and, and I agree with you that one would say, um, you know, you're not pointing to a change that took place recently to conform it to something that was just canonized. It could have been that they're trying to match the Hafs reading from the beginning. But the interesting thing is the Hafs reading didn't gain also popularity until later, many centuries later. And there are many traditions of Hafs, of course. Uh, this is one of at least five that we know of. We have seven in London. And seven there you go. Hafs, Hafs readings. But uh, even attributed to him, put it that way, attributed to Hafs. That's right. And, yeah. and, and, and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate right now. Even if early on the scribes were trying to conform to a specific reading, that tells me that they're discounting the Warsh and any other readings as well. So technically speaking, that in and of itself could be problematic. Again, this is something for me to unpack, of course. Yeah, many of the things that we consider to be the Hafs, the Hafs reading are represented in the short vowels and um, in, in some few cases with uh, maybe the, the, uh, the diacritics. But um, so it's not going to show up in these manuscripts. Can I can so, I back up? Can I just yeah. back you up on this, Dan, real quickly? The Huff's reading this man that died in 796. He, that's his date that yeah. he died. So that's late eighth century. The only difference between him and say Al Duri and Al Husayn, all these other readings, Warsh included, is really only dottings and vowelization. Am I correct? Primarily. Yeah. Um, Al, do you know differently on on me than that? Because I. I, I, for the most part, that is true, and I don't know if there are exceptions to that. I do know the people who would know that answers to that question. Yeah, I mean, it's it's primarily uh, the way to pronounce more so than the resm itself. Yeah. So the resm yeah. is the same between yeah. Alduri, uh, Zaini, all these uh, yeah. Warish. The, the resm would be the same on all these manuscripts up until the late 8th century. Am I correct on that? Uh, for the most part, yeah. And so when I say it conforms to Hafs, I've I've kind of bounced around as far as how do I, how do I say that when I'm comparing it to the modern edition, um, because the modern edition, the Rasam, the bare skeletal text, really does align with, uh, with with all the all the readings, for the, for the most part. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's just it's it's kind of I haven't found out exactly the right way to uh, best represent what it is that I'm. Um, that I'm talking about here, and every term that I use has some way that you can criticize it. If you say the 1924 edition, then people will criticize for using a modern edition as a standard, and yeah, and so forth. So now I, let's back up. Why don't or, we say this then, Dan? Would you say? And of course, the manuscripts that you're looking at, the manuscripts where you've done all your work, are really the earliest manuscripts, are they not? So we're talking about yes. eighth, ninth, and tenth century manuscripts. Yeah. And uh, 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 Huffs would have been would have died by the late eighth century, seven ninety six. Yeah. So this yeah. is really a moot point, uh, whether we call it Huffs or not, because he would have he was in the same time period that you're looking at. But what we're asking, maybe maybe you don't know, have an answer, but I'd love to push this a little bit. When do you think then the Rosum was standardized, the, was canonized? Not the diacritical marks, not the vowelization, because that's what I think is really happening with when uh, this man, Muhammad Al, uh, Ali Al Husseini Al Haddad in, in, Cai in Cairo in 1924, he just took one Rosum, not Rosum standard, he was looking at one Girat standard, one Reading, Uhud exactly. standard. Yeah. That's all he's saying in 1924. Am I correct? I believe that's right. I, I'm not. I haven't done an extensive study on that. There's a very good article that's written on it, but I haven't done an extensive study on what went into that 1924 edition. Um, but it's an interesting and important question. But uh, but yes. Yeah, so going to your question about when the everything was all set in place and standardized. I'm not actually prepared to answer that question at the moment. I am organizing the corrections according to the time period, according to the script style now. And I think that what I, well, what I've done is really to, to try to gather as much um, data as I can so that patterns can start to emerge and patterns are starting to emerge. 
but there's a lot of analysis yet to be done on those. Okay, Dan, so, now, now, the, now you're getting picking my, uh, my interest because now really I think you're going to be doing something that nobody has done before in another area. And that is, let's ask when the first, the, the first skeletal text, the first rosum is complete. Would, do you think you'll ever come to, well, you can't say that now because we just don't have a complete manuscript of the rosum yet. When do you yeah. think this will be or this will happen? Because as you're going through all these these variants, and these are skeletal variants, these are rosum variants, these are consonantal variants, uh, these you're going to come sooner or later to a manuscript that has the same rosum that we are using today. I, I hope you're going to find that at some point. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a natural question. Um, I will say that I, one of the other editions that I'm preparing at the moment and that I presented a paper on uh, in uh, November in San Diego is I found a manuscript that is probably first half of the um, of the 8th century that is has been corrected in many places. It's actually featured in, in this book, but it's corrected in many places, but is variant, remains variant, significantly variant in many other places. So I'm um, preparing an edition of that entire um, fragment, uh, which is part of a larger manuscript. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting because you here have something that's not a palimpsest. It's not a 7th century manuscript, and yet it is uh, significantly variant. It's very interesting. Off the top of your head, and maybe this is something where we can now segue into what you are doing and then what you plan to do. Off the top of your head, before you get into um, that, uh, well, actually, we're gonna. This is maybe this is we we, we do want to go ask you where you which where you're heading to and what you think you will find or what you're going to do for the the future. Can you kind of help us there? Give us where you're going to be heading so we can follow with you. But also, what you think you're going to find at the very end? What is it your what is the the holy grail that you would like to find the uh, be able to share with the world? That's a big open question. <laughs> I want you to be prophetic because then we're gonna we're gonna remind you of this twenty years from now. We're gonna say this is what you said in two thousand nineteen. Let's see if you've made it in two thousand twenty thirty nine. Remember, right. we, we like to critique people, so that's what we do. <laughs> you like to what? We like to critique people, so that, that's what we like to do for Well, we day. like to critique ideas, but ideas come from people, so we're not criticizing you. And this is not critical. I would really like to know where you're going, because I'm excited by your work. This is, you're the first to have done this. You're way ahead of everybody else. So we'd like to see where you think you're going to go in the next 20 years. Yeah, well, I, there are many, many more. I've looked at a lot of manuscripts, but there are many more. Uh, in some many of which I know about that I've not yet been able to visit and others that I know where there are manuscripts but I, I'm not exactly sure you know I've, it's been really a process of discovery even where these manuscripts are located so I have a lot more to look at and other people I'm sure will start um, traveling and looking at these as well um, I'm coming near to one major milestone which is compiling these things together into um, a, um, into a, a printed edition, but that will grow, I think, through multiple editions as, as I gather more material and, and put that in there, and then people can begin to work with this and um, take note of patterns and, and use it in their own, in their own research, um, sub substantiate or, or knock down their own theories and hypotheses and so forth. Where is this going to go as far as what conclusion will it come to? Well, that, I wouldn't be a very good uh, a good scholar if I pre, I mean, I, I can imagine, but I, I, I'm not going to preset a conclusion uh, to this. But I think in a very general sense, we're going to come to a picture that's a little bit more granular than the standard, uh, than what's been commonly accepted. And that's that wouldn't be at all surprising. Of course, the, pa the past is complex and uh, we're going to, be able to discern more of these complexities as people look more carefully at these objects. 
Well, I think you're already f- coming to that conclusion. I, from this book that you have here, it seems like this is the first step towards that. And I listen, we want to encourage you both, Al-Fadi and I. You've been a great brother. You've been a great friend. Uh, you've been a great scholar. Uh, we've admired you. For, uh, we've known you for a number of years. We like to see where you're going. You're a very humble man. You don't like to preach your own, uh, blow your own trumpet. Uh, so we're going to blow your trumpet for you because I think you need to have more people supporting you. I think you need to have many more people reading this book. And anybody, that, those of you who are watching, go and buy it. It's on Amazon.com, am I correct? It, it is, and um, and thank you for reminding me, but I've, uh, the, the price has gone down today. $23 uh, to, now. No, it's actually at $12.50 through the end of the year, so. Are you That's serious? Wonderful. Go get it, this is the time to get it. Yeah. It's one third the price. Till the end of the year, that means they have till uh, December 31st to get it at that price. Uh, at the moment, yeah. And so I, I think that I just wanted to get that out to more people. And especially at this moment, time of the year, it's a nice time if anybody was waiting to get it. I know the price has been steep. I apologize for that. Um, but, um, but yeah. You didn't have any control yeah, over that, though, did you? Sorry? You don't have control over the price, do you? I, I do. Um, but there are also costs involved with it. So the color edition, unfortunately, is quite a bit more expensive to produce. So that uh, remains at the um, at the other price. Okay. So. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Listen, this has been fun talking with you. This has been excellent having you on board. Uh, we love to just pick your mind. You've got such a bright mind. You're able to do so much more than I can do. Uh, Al-Fadi is coming up to your level because he is doing similar type of area. Uh, you guys, you, Al-Fadi, and you are unique in the world. I'm just glad we have men like you who are dedicated to uh, um, unpacking difficult, difficult, difficult uh, material. This is, uh, you're the first to do it. Uh, Keith Small was your precursor to you, got you interested in it. Uh, we know Keith Small, we miss him. Uh, he has been a great man aboard, aboard with us. Uh, we want to make sure that we continue to come back and have more interviews with you as you introduce new books. We want to make sure that we also get those books and read them and, uh, and that uh, many others read it. It's very readable, this book here. It's been, it's made for the layman, isn't it? It's made for people like you and me. Uh, it, there, it's also made for the scholar because it has both the all the, the reference forms and all the, the Arabics, but in some ways you don't even have to know Arabic to understand what you have introduced here. That's so right. God bless you, Dan, for what you've done. Amen. May you have yeah, many more years and may we see many more books coming from your pen. We really hope and pray that the people uh, who have watched the series and also, you know, maybe we encourage you to buy the book. You heard, you know, the price is going down and this is a smoking deal actually uh, in my estimation and the book is worth it. Uh, that you um, will find this book to be a very helpful resource to you. If you're a Muslim, uh, we want you to really look at it with an open mind. Uh, there is nothing in here that is pointed at you. Uh, it's mainly laying out facts. And if you are someone who is working with Muslims, we hope that this is one of those great tools that you can benefit from. And hopefully even our video series would help you unpack the book if you don't have the time, let's say, to read it, uh, even though it's a very simple read. Actually, I read the whole thing uh, one time when I was flying, you know, so uh, that, that tells you how easy it was just to go through it. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff in there, but you can definitely go through it. So thank you again. Uh, join us next time as we continue our discussion related in relationship to early Quranic manuscripts. And I can assure you that the work of Dr. Brobaker will be uh, you know, a cornerstone uh, to uh, those kind of discussions. Lord bless you, and until we meet again, um, have a blessed day. Hi, everyone. want to uh, say a big thank you again to Al and Jay for inviting me to come on here. It's uh, been wonderful to have people so interested in the work that I do as a scholar. It, it just... It's a, it's a wonderful situation to have people care about the subject of your research. And unfortunately, it's not a situation that every scholar gets to enjoy. So I do enjoy it. I do enjoy your interest. Um, want to let you know that uh, my ongoing work now is partly made possible by um, financial participation from uh, other people who care about what it is that I do. And uh, if you would like to become part of this work, and support me in my ongoing uh, travel, uh, research, and publication, there's now a way for you to do that. Uh, you can go to danielbrewbaker.com, and there you'll find a link that will allow you to set up a one-time or recurring donation 
and uh, your gifts, thanks to the partnership of uh, some other folks, are 100% uh, tax deductible. So thank you for considering that. And by the way, DanielBrewBaker.com is also now going to become the hub for my blog posts, uh, my sort of outlet of information about what it is that I do, um, listing of my publications from time to time, uh, new material will go up there. So if you're interested in this work, you can sign up there to be notified when new material comes up, or you can check back from time to time and uh, see what's new. So thanks. Thanks so much for that. Um, that's the financial appeal. And uh, I'm so grateful if you would consider that. There's one other sort of category of things I wanted to mention to you now, if you have a moment. And that is that uh, I've noticed over the years as I've done this work that it's really excited. <laughs> it really, um, uh, it is exciting work and it's easy for uh, people to get excited about what it is that I research. And uh, in their zeal, sometimes people will repost the material without thinking to give uh, a direct credit to the one, the one who made it and the one who discovered it. So um, I do take it as a compliment uh, and it's an honor. Uh, but do want to mention that what I've done has been done with um, a great deal of uh, effort and time and uh, care, uh, attention to detail and quality control and so forth. And so um, it is helpful to me as you uh, go about your uh, discussion of my, my work to remember a couple of things. Number one, uh, if you do um, share my work, please give me credit for it uh, by name just basic uh, request. Number two, um, you should be aware that many of the photographs that I've uh, published, I had to get permission, copyright permission from the copyright owners to do that. And other photographs that I published are my own copyright because they're my photographs. Uh, in every case, you should take care to get permission uh, if you are going to republish something from the copyright owners. Uh, and then number three, um, if you do happen to come across material online or elsewhere that you think is mine, but that doesn't have credit to me, if you would um, be so kind as to help me out by leaving a comment at danielbrewbaker.com, it's not because I want to be hard on anybody or anything like that. It's just helpful to me to be able to contact those folks because I don't always really pay that much attention to things, but it's helpful to me to know, have sort of a heads up so I can contact them and let them know to how to appropriately credit me. Or if it's one of my colleagues, I can let them know how to credit my colleague as well. Um, so that's about it. Uh, we're about five years post uh, doctorate for me. Um, it's an exciting time. I know it took a long time for me to get my first little book out, um, but there is more coming. So it's going to be an exciting time the next couple of years. And thank you for your interest. I hope it'll be an interesting time for you. And uh, I do look forward to publishing more and, and getting more in, into your hands uh, for those of you who are interested. Thank you again to Alan Jay for inviting me on and uh, wish you all the best. And thanks again. Talk to you soon. Bye.